put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. Outlast Video Game Review You play as Miles Upshur, a freelance reporter. Having gotten an anonymous tip, you go to the Mount Massive Asylum, which has an ugly past. And the, the asylum was reopened a few years before this takes place. And after decades of having been shut down because of said ugly past and you're going into now to discover the truth of what really went on in there which involves former Nazis bizarre experiments and you know some some have called it weird I it's based on Norse myth, including, you know, Germanic folk folklore, which, yeah, you know, that Germany, they, they would somewhat believe in it. It's, it's part of our shared heritage, me being Danish, so Scandinavian. I don't know, you know, a, a chainsaw replacing a hand, that's weird. It's awesome, but it's weird. This, the story here, not that weird. It just yeah, you know, follows these some Norse myth and it goes into how do you fight evil, what is evil even, and who is to blame for evil. And to to briefly go into the ending, as many have said, you know, many say that it's kind of meh or decent or could be better. I would go so far as to say it's downright bad. But you no. Know, horror endings are often, yeah, you know, it's it's really difficult to end a horror story in a very satisfying way. Yeah. Now, you, the moment you're inside, you know, immediately Miles wants to leave, and you, you can understand why, but it is kind of, what, what did you expect to find in there? You knew at least some of the, the past of it. Now, the, the plot is told in part through you taking notes from the raw footage you capture with the camera and these folders that you find, you know, having been written by the staff of the asylum. And, you know, both of these are stored so you can reread them later. And a lot of what Miles writes and as well as what you find in the folders is kind of teenage -y, full of swearing and just, you know, not really that professional and certainly at least too casual. And I, you know, yeah, it, it's the kind of thing that, you know, people do in this kind of thing to maybe more appeal to teenagers and such, which I fully respect. But these aren't teenage characters. These aren't teenagers. And personally, I find that the you know, descriptions from from professionals in horror games, you know, professionals who've done horrible things, it's much, it has much more of an impact if it's like detached and really professional. And some of this comes close to that, but, you know, when you read the, you know, about the, about some of the stuff in, you know, Amnesia the Dark Descent, you know, it's it's horrifying because it's so detached and it's just, well, you know, you, then you do that and then you, you know, yeah. And of course we again have the cliché, reporter goes somewhere dangerous. Yeah. Now this is very you know, this really kind of captures the feeling of the found footage horror genre, you know, wreck, paranormal activity and such, but with the great twist that you're the one recording 
these things and yeah now you can turn off the motion blur others have pointed out there's the, the film grain effect is you know kind of there all the time and this uses real history of early inhuman treatments for you know psychiatric patients you find the asylum to still hold many patients and possibly some doctor doctors and they're all screwed up by said you know terrible you know treatments and experiments and you know you you don't see an awful lot of these treatments again you know amnesia the dark descent does this you know much better but still and they're they're like physically and mentally scarred you know the the skin looks like it's been partially burnt and you know some of them are missing body parts and or have replaced body parts with something else and the you know one of my personal favorites you see this guy in the trailer so it's not really you know this slim tall doctor type and he's got like this mechanical eye thing and he runs you know and dude's got this huge like I don't even know if it's like you know the, this huge scissor scissors huge pair of scissors that you know and dude runs with them so I don't know what is it you know but yeah, this, I, I don't even know if it's the kind you would use to prune trees and, and, you know, bushes and whatnot. It looks much too big for even that, and it's like rusty and just, yeah, he's, he's really memorable. Now, it varies how, you know, the, these patients, it varies how aware, awake, and violent they are, which, you know, much like the taste of human flesh varies from person to person and you know some of these patients are you know scared and some of them are perfectly harmless and some of the violent ones are behind bars although in some cases you may have to go to where they are and of course when you get there they've gone but you know that you're now in the area where they are so they might just show back up at some point. And yeah, the the homicidal patients will hunt you down. And there are some ongoing, including the, the doctor guy I just mentioned. Mostly it's, you know, Chris Walker, this guy, big sadist, claws, fingers, unbelievable personally i found he was not the most you know compellingly characterized or you know most memorable or creepy of the various designs my favorite was the doctor guy but yeah and you know some have pointed out you know some of the character designs could be better still there are some really as, as i said memorable and creepy designs This is somewhat similar to Penumbra and Amnesia, at least Amnesia 1. I have not gotten around to a machine for pigs yet. And before I start, I'm, I'm going to be saying some negative things about Penumbra and Amnesia in some of my comparisons here. I do want to underline, I love, you know, both Penumbras, shut up, there's only two, and Amnesia. Um, you know, the dark descent, and you know, just in general, you know, frictional games, and yeah, paradox. Right? Love what they put out, and you know, what, what's the next one? Sona or something? Cannot wait for that. Anyway, you know, just from like the trailer and such, looks amazing, and I love that they don't so much, you know, keep going in the same series, but that they, you know, Penumbra 
the two chapters, again, only two, were always meant to be two. It's not like sequel kind of thing. It's that, you know, they released the overall story in two chapters, which vary somewhat. And, yeah, you know, otherwise, you know, first they make Penumbra, then they make Amnesia, now they're moving on to Sona. They, rather than trying to redo something or the like in the same series, they move on to something else and actually apply everything they've learned, which is, you know, Penumbra is great. Amnesia is freaking amazing. Now, yes, unlike Amnesia 1, in this you do have to save and make progress, you know, you can actually die, you know, it won't just mean that you'll respawn at the place you died with the monster that killed you gone. Yeah, clearly the developers of Amnesia 1, you know, yeah, again, Frictional and Paradox were worried that the game would end up impossible because of how overpowered the monsters are if it didn't work out like this and yeah that's you know to me that means they should have made these monsters less powerful rather than yeah and you know this does not have a fatal flaw similar to that or at least I didn't find you know why it's a, I'll get back. I'll get into the the high chase mechanic and my experience with it in a little bit. Now, and this this auto saves by checkpoint, and again, it tells you when it saves, which is again something that kind of bothered me about Amnesia One. Again, it you know it helps the immersion, but yeah, sometimes you do kind of want to know. Okay, if if this goes completely wrong, will I start back at this or that place? Yeah. And you can load previous saves, as far as I could tell, any previous save. You know, or you can just click continue and load from the most recent save. And yeah, and this differentiates itself very much from those in, you know, from Penumbra and Amnesia 1. In several ways, but in part by the camera, not not the first person perspective, but the viewfinder of the camera. And some have mentioned, you know, quick time events in this. I don't. I didn't run run into very many of those. I, I don't know if I was just lucky and didn't, but I think it was maybe one in the whole of this that I ran into. Now, where a lot of horror, horror has you fighting the, you know, the, the monsters in varying degrees of how powerful you are when compared to them. You know, I mean, I love Nocturne, but, you know, not always, but sometimes the game gives you an absurd amount of powerful guns and lots of ammo for them. Like the most recent time I played through Nocturne, I, I have a tendency to save up ammo as long as much as I can. The most recent playthrough of Nocturne, I was like, okay, I'm gonna see if I can actually run out of ammo because I know how long this portion of the game is before, you know, I get more guns and ammo. I'm gonna see if I can actually spend it all and end up having to at least resort to just melee did not happen. Just, it's, I think it's mainly, especially the first, mainly and especially the first chapter of that, where it's just absurd. And, and it's cool, but it does make it less scary overall. But, but yeah, you know, this does not allow, which, you know, also like Penumbra 2. Penumbra 1 allows you to fight, and Amnesia 1. Penumbra, you know, Overture, you're allowed to fight, and it's just super awkward. But yeah, and the the action e part of this, which isn't so much action as just another part of the horror, is the parkour, which I was really glad to find is realistic for someone who's in fine enough, you know, physical shape. You know, no wall running, no jumping, you know absurdly long distances or such.
where first person parkour was terrible in Mirror's Edge. Here they they do it almost all the way right. That there's very little you can criticize about the parkour in this, at least at least in the implementation. I'm, you know, you might not think that it should have parkour. I would beg to differ. I think that's exactly, you know, it's a good way to give the player, it's, horror really, it serves horror well when the player is disempowered. It's, you know, all fiction, it's, it's especially impactful if the protagonist cannot do that much about this, you know, the, the thing that is, you know, that we're afraid of. And sometimes that goes too far. Again, you know, Penumbra and Amnesia, sometimes you're just too disempowered and it's just frustrating to play. And making it possible to outrun enemies is a very good, which you can almost or times do in aforementioned, but yeah, in, in this, it's genuinely a feature, and yeah, you, you feel like, you know, there, there are horror games where you can't move that fast, and it's like, why can't I move fast? It's, you know, it, who wouldn't run in this situation? Okay, I get, like, frozen by fear, but that, again, doesn't make for that compelling gameplay. But, yeah, you know, here, in contrast to Mirror's Edge, you can see what you're going to do when you interact with something in the parkour. You can usually tell where to go. It doesn't start and stop awkwardly. And when you're, you know, when you're going to make a jump, you can basically tell how close you are to the edge. And, you know, I found that in this, even when you miss something, it'll cost you a second or two rather than instantly mean death, which again, all too often was the case in Mirror's Edge. And in, in general, I didn't find this to, you know, kill me when the parkour went wrong. This, the only times I died in this were at the hands of the inmates, which again, I'm not certain that there aren't, you know, that there aren't places where you could die from, you know, environmental hazards, but I didn't run into any of them. And with all that said, you will sometimes walk off a ledge where you're trying to get him to walk along. You can tell that, you know, it's a narrow ledge. You're going to be carefully, slowly walking along it. And yeah, when you try to do that, mines will just straight up, you know, run off. And it's again, I feel like just put it on the use key. You know, just when you approach it, press use and he immediately gets out to, to do the ledge walk. Now, I was wondering how the camera would work out with you doing parkour. And that's also something that is interesting in, you know, found footage and POV horror. You know, there's there's that thing of put down the camera and either run or help, you know. And yeah, what was it? The, the was it Chris Rock who said, you know, if, if I'm in a Rodney King situation, put down the camera and just help me, you know. I don't know. It might have been before Chris Rock. As Richard, Richard Pryor, maybe? Anyway. Both very funny. Yeah. So, so yeah. You can run with the camera out. You know, you, you, you know, I was thinking, you know, okay, you put it away really fast. Maybe you have a lottery, you know, coat pocket, inner coat pocket. No, you can pretty much, you know, yeah, or, or, you know, accidentally drop it. You, you do drop it sometimes, I'll get more into that. But yeah, you can be filming while you're running, while you're crawling through vents, while you're vaulting, even when you, you know, slip through these, you know, tight vertical, you know, squeeze through a tight vertical slip. And yes, when you are 
walking along a ledge. The only times, basically, that you can't have the camera out is when you're hanging off said ledge or, you know, crawling, climbing a ladder. So basically, when you for sure do not have your hands free, but somehow, even with, you know, like when you're walking along the ledge, you want, you know, your arms out to your side, just, you know, keep, you know, be as capable of, of holding on. I don't know. I guess he has, you know, one hand on the. Yeah, it's it's very impressive. It's, I guess this is why he he makes a really good reporter because even when things are just insane around him, he can still operate the camera just fine. And yeah, sometimes you will fall. You know, the scripted events. You will fall, and the camera will be dropped. You know, at, at least in that situation, it is. You know, okay. I guess he wouldn't be able to hold on to it. And, and it's also, it's not like he's just placing, you, you see the camera, it's one of those nice little camcorder things. He would have to be holding it. Anyway, yeah, you know, you fold, camera, you know, drop the camera, pick it up, it'll pretty much just be, you know, yeah, it'll, it'll pretty much just operate fine. So, Really sturdy, and that again gets into you know POV horror with like you know how how can it pick up the audio all the way over there? How can it zoom so much and so well? And wouldn't it get hurt in these circumstances? You know, yeah. Now you can hide from enemies in you know inside lockers or under beds or the like. But these will be searched by some of the smarter enemies. And like in Amnesia 1, if you block the and, and you know somewhat penumbra, if you close and block the door, you know, you can you can close the door, you can even block the door. In both cases, the enemy will just break his way through it, although it can buy you some time. With that said, if the inmate can just go around, yeah, you know, he's just going to go around. And, you know, there are, there are some areas where you're going back and forth in the same basic, you know, area. And there are a number of doors between these areas. And if you close the door and then he breaks through it, you just lost an option of slowing him down. You know, you may want to save the doors until you're ready to leave that area. Instead, of, yeah, really, really cool. And it has been pointed out that hiding doesn't always work. I, I saw someone, you know, say that you know hiding only works one tenth of the time. I didn't use the you know hiding under beds and in lockers all that much. I'll get into what I did in a little bit. Now, in you know, with with stealth in in horror, in amnesia and somewhat also penumbra to a lesser extent penumbra. You know, you're almost kind of scared to find the enemies you know, in order to be able to hide from them, because if you spot them, there's a good chance they spotted you too. And, you know, you can run, you can block a door, you may not be able to actually prevent him from killing you, you may just postpone it, which again then leads to you respawning, and yeah. Or if you can, you know, if you're going from one area to another, you know, where, where it loads, that also, but that's just awkward. But yeah, you know, that will stop the guy hunting you. Which, you know, there are some of the chases where that's a good thing, where that works. You know, if, if let's say you were chased by something which lives best in a certain element, and once you go through that door, you're no longer in that element that works but you know if it's just a regular humanoid monster you know you open the door you go to there so it's like he can break down every other door why can't he break down this one so yeah
Also, some of the enemies in this will actually just open the door. You know, so not really slow down much at all by you closing the door on them, which is really rude. Now, and, and I swear, in Amnesia 1, every playthrough, there's at least one who's just hiding out behind the door that I, you know, then open, and it's like, you know, it's almost kind of funny when you, you open the door and then you immediately slam it, hoping that, you know, he didn't see me or, you know, nobody's home or whatever. But yeah, it's just, that's just ridiculously unfair when you can't particularly outrun them, you can't stop them from making progress, you know. And also, you know, if you go into a room in Amnesia 1 trying to hide from one of the monsters, you know, trying to outrun them and get into you probably just blocked yourself up. You know, you, you got yourself into a you know, what's it called? Yeah, you, you just locked yourself in basically because he's gonna come through that door and there's only the one door. So yeah. You know, the the puzzles in Amnesia One are great. You know, really logical, tough but not frustrating. But they are too complex for these, you know, for you not having a map you can carry or a mini map or even a compass, which again, I love that the game doesn't give you any of those. For for such, and, and you know, the, the areas you move through are too big for enemies that just kill you instantly and that you often just cannot flee. Now in, you know, if, if it were like in Thief 1 and 2 where, you know, enemies keep to a certain patrol route or guard post unless they see you and you can take them out, which again, I don't really feel you should be, I feel the, the, some of the most compelling horror is where at least some of the enemies you cannot take out. But yeah, that kind of situation, you know, yeah, that, that works quite well, but here you can usually get away, you know, and even if you are being chased, the puzzles are very simple. You know, get the fuse box counter up and running and just, yeah, you know, there's a stationary, you know, object that you have to start up and or maybe you have to pick something up to, you know, go grab a key that old, you know, familiar trope, or, you know, pick something up that is required to start off the station or thing. It's really easy. And, yeah, for that, it, it works that you're, you know, that you can be chased a lot because it's not like, crap, where am I even, where am I, where am I going, and do I need more objects for this, and, you know, more items for this next puzzle, and so on and so forth. Now, the on on the idea of stealth in a horror game, especially a survival horror game, you know, stealth by its nature is tense. You're trying to avoid something or other, so. Essentially, you are scared of it, scared of it spotting you, or scared of what'll and or scared of what'll do if it finds you. And yeah, that yeah, the the two really make a lot of sense to combine. And I I don't know why so few horror and survival horror games do you know actually particularly allow for stealth. And, you know, here I found from right away, you know, because you're disempowered, because you cannot fight these enemies, the way I dealt with it was what I'm going to be referring to as actively hiding, where basically I was hiding but not stationary. You know, I would be, you know, going around picking up some of those few objects you need to, you know, activating something stationary so that I was making progress, you know, not really slowing down, not, not really, you know, hiding in one particular spot, 
but trying to avoid making noise or, you know, being in the light for very long and, you know, very, very thief in, in that regard. And, yeah, you know, it's, it's remarkably tense here. And, you know, I, I don't know if maybe... If, I feel like if I had approached this with, with stealth, of, and, and maybe this is what some people did, I'm not saying, you know, everyone, and for all I know, I'm really, I really wasn't supposed to actively hide, but it's what worked for me, but yeah, you know, if you approach it like Thief, Splinter Cell, Commandos, or Hitman, where, again, you know, there are guard posts, there are patrols, and the levels can be very open, not uh, so much in Splinter Cell, not always in Hitman. But, you know, Thief 2 and Commandos, very open. Yeah, you know, in those, you can actually continuously hide from the enemies as long as you... And it helps that you can take them out so that you're not, you know... That's the thing, in those, you wouldn't really be able to actively hide. There, there are just too many enemies. And in this, there aren't, there aren't that many at any given time. So, yeah, you know, it's, yeah, I found actively hiding to, to work rather well. And frankly, this is my favorite stealth implementation and approach of any survival horror or horror game in general with stealth and yeah I consider it to be better stealth you know better done stealth than you know amnesia one and I mean at least in amnesia Justine you know the the I think free DLC to amnesia one at least you face some blind enemies not a spoiler even the first one is blind and thus it's just about not making too much noise and you know trying to determine where is he going and such but yeah i i demand more survival horror go this route and you know it's not like i got used to the enemies you know they're they're still completely deadly you know i was still really you know scared of being found and caught by one of them and yeah you know that this was clearly something that they were worried about with Amnesia 1 and Penumbra. You know, in, in Amnesia you go insane if you look at the enemies and in Penumbra you risk panicking and, and such. So, yeah, you know, in, in those they were really worried that you would get used to them and, and that also does make sense. And, you know, you, you want to not you know, the less the less we see and hear of the enemy, or at least see, you know, the less we have a chance to get used to them, the more scary they remain. You know, see, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street 1 versus the later ones. You know, watch Nightmare on Elm Street 1 and just mind why, forget everything you think you know about Freddy Krueger and just, you know, that, that really works, but yeah, it's, you know, the, it's, it's the issue of overexposing the, the enemy, and yeah, here it still worked out really well, and it maybe helps that there are more different enemy designs in this than in Amnesia, which again isn't really a the, the, the difference stems in part from the explanation behind the, the you know, the enemies, the, the monsters that, that hunt you. In this, there can be a lot because, again, these are, these are different human beings. You know, they're, they're, they're unique in, you know, how, you know, the, the experiments didn't, do the exact same thing to everyone, and even on the ones that it did some of the same things to, they retain some personality or the like. You know, again, it's like they were already insane, and then these experiments brought out some of that insanity, and 
their insanity varies greatly between the inmates. And I'm not going to give away what the explanation is behind Amnesia's monsters, but yeah, that it just it does allow for less, you know, fewer designs of of the humanoid ones. I maintain that there's there's a certain one which is just ingeniously done. Now but but yeah, you know, in this to to deal with the enemies, you know, I would actively hide and failing that it of course becomes the game of tag, which it tends to do in these games where you can sprint and or parkour and you can't fight the enemies and the enemies you know have are limited to melee attacks I you know one one sort of other thing that I did in addition to the actively hiding was hide in a locker or under a bed until the enemy got really close because if he's looking you know let's say he you know he moves from left to right in checking out the different hiding spots and you positioned yourself in one of the right rightermost ones the moment he opens the leftmost one exit and bolt and you just got a head start because not only, you know, you know exactly where he is. You're not accidentally going to run into him. And you've got a head start because he didn't expect you to be there and he didn't expect you to run. So he's like slightly disoriented and, you know, turns around and runs after you. And yeah, at, at that point, you just got to know where to run to. And most of the time you do in this because the, the areas are not that, you know, yeah, it's it's not that difficult to find your way in the overall and also often you get to explore before you have to run. You you get to explore an area, you know, freely, you know. And it's just you know, more more so than in the aforementioned, you know, Thief, Commando, Splinter Cell, and Hitman where you do have to be you constantly have to be wary of the guys who are who can find you and yeah in this with so few enemies you can often investigate an area and if you're actively hiding even if he's looking for you you can usually find the way you're supposed to go in order to you know proceed to the next area the parkour chases are a lot of fun and they often end with you going into an area where they clearly can't follow which is again a really clever way to do again in amnesia one and penumbra and such you basically just yeah sooner or later they'll catch up to you unless you do manage to just successfully fully hide but yeah, often that just isn't even that much of an option because you don't get out of their view for long. You know, they can they can run about as fast, sometimes faster than you. So, yeah, and yeah, it's just okay. They give up looking. That's that's kind of okay. But if they know exactly where you are but just can't follow yet, that means they're still looking for you. You're gonna run into. They know the asylum much better than you do. It's just a matter of time before they come back. And just the satisfaction of moving into an area and you can you can maybe look back and see, you know, the, the inmates standing there and just, you know, next time, next time, you yeah. And yeah, it's it's because they may, you know, not be in as good shape or it's just you know, yeah, to, you know, for, for one reason or another, they maybe can't fall. You know, maybe you jumped into a vent or the like, and maybe they're slightly too big to enter that vent, or you slip through one of those vertical slips, and it really is, you know, you have to be tiny to fit in one of those. And yeah, Miles is not that big of a guy. 
where you know a number of the inmates are kind of muscly and such and just wouldn't fit through there. Now and and you know on the other hand, if they can follow you, they will. You know, if, if again if if there's a door that leads to where you just went. And also just you can be running, you can be shutting doors behind you, you can, you know, traverse various you know, you can be vaulting over stuff and, and such. Some of them will be able to follow you through all that. So yeah. And yeah, you know, with and, and when you run, you can look behind you without it slowing you down any. And yeah, that's a really good, both it's it's really useful to see if you know it, it it you may not be sure could he follow me through there, or you may just need to see how much distance is there between us. And yeah, it's also just it really makes it a lot more scary and again it makes sense because who can't do a quick you know look behind you know I, I again I kinda call BS on the idea that you can run just as fast and just as comfortably whilst looking behind you but it's it's POV horror again so yeah and actually you know there are parts of Thief where you can kind of you know, just, yeah, out, outrun some of the enemies and, you know, if you get to a place they can't follow or where it at least will take a while for them to get to where you are, you can breathe more easily. Which again, I'm not sure I... I may not be playing that entirely the way they meant for, but again, I'm saving up ammo and just it's fun. It's a lot of fun to to play it like that. And as others have pointed out, there's a little openness in how you deal with these enemies. The AI is good. They don't appear to spawn randomly, but they will roam. And you know, you will have to be close to them to see them. You know, again, I'm, you know, barring them being in the light or you being in the light. And the, you know, the gameplay has been praised. You know, others have already pointed out, you can't really close doors silently. You know, you automatically slam them if you close them. And, you know, when you open a door, you can you can just fully open it regularly, you know, if, if you're just, if you're running away from someone, you'll just open it, just, you know, but if you're kind of scared what's on the other side, you can open it slowly by, you know, holding down the use button, then moving forward or backward depending on whether it opens out or in, and just, yeah, very slowly open it, and it will literally only open when you move forward or backward and you can kind of start to close it again and such, yeah. Now, there are a few times where you encounter double doors and Miles will open them both, but when he, when you ask him to close, he'll only close one, which, yeah, and, and that leaves the other door completely open for the inmate to run through. And he doesn't, I don't know why, but that's useful for you, so you don't have to worry about it. Because if you try to close both, you're likely to just reopen the one you just closed. But, yeah, I, I don't know, maybe they just hate doors. You know, what's what's that thing from from the Spoonie and Scene Link Horror review of Alone in the Dark? Did, did a door kill his family? Now... Unlike Penumbra and Amnesia, this does not have the realistic physics where you can, you know, pick up and throw or drop or carry pretty much any object you'd expect to, and, you know, the puzzles also really 
you know, use the the physics as you know, where if you if you're trying to crank something open with a crowbar, you don't just press the crowbar, you press it and then you move it in the direction you'd expect to to yeah. And in fact in this you can hardly interact with anything. You can open and close doors, pick up batteries, pick up the you know folders and use things, you know. And and this again helps in you not really you don't necessarily linger, so it's nice and easy to be moving, you know, if you're running through an area because there's someone after you or or just actively hiding, you don't, you know, stop short and, you know, okay, maybe I need this, maybe I need to combine this. You don't even really have an inventory. Basically, when you go to where you look at objectives, and it'll also only have one line of objectives, It'll say if you have like a key or something else you have to pick up for, but that's it. You know, you can't even like click on it to get a description or anything. And there are times where you don't really know where to go. And it, again, it has already been pointed out. You don't necessarily really have a sense of direction. And there is no map or mini map or compass or anything. As already mentioned, this doesn't ever really make you completely helpless, which, again, as others have pointed out, would, you know, was something that amnesia, at least one, did, you know, too often. There are some jumping puzzles. And the, you know, it's already been pointed out also that the second half is just not as good as the first. Some say it's downright bad, and I would say it's, you know, it's not as good as the, the first half. But, yeah, you know, you're running more than actively hiding. And the, you know, I quite like that this has, again, something that really distinguishes it from most other of these usually you'll have like a flashlight something that you can point to an area and it'll show that area even if you're like several meters away although to be fair you know amnesia one with its lantern also has some of this effect that you can only look relatively close to yourself through the IR but with this it doesn't give off light either and that's I haven't seen any other do it like this so you can be looking at an enemy however long you want to through the IR and he won't see the the light coming off from you know because it's just it's it's a filter on the camera it's not actually giving off light now you you know, you have to, the, the light will use the batteries, you know, you can be running the camera all the time. It's only really when you use IR that it, you know, uses batteries. And it's basically, it's on the R key, you know, you reload batteries, which is nice, you know, I, it's, it's kind of like with Alan Wake, where you also, you know, reload the flashlight. Although in that case, you also, of course, reload guns, but yeah, it's, it's not really necessary to go into the inventory to be putting in batteries or, you know, more oil for the lantern in Amnesia, Amnesia 1 because it's just, you know, it's it's not that difficult it's, and it's something you have to get used to if, you know, the person in the situation will have to get used to that because you have to do it all, all the time so, yeah, it might as well just be on a single button for you to, yeah. And this also uses the, the great, you know, the, the effect where, where IR makes, you know, eyes really creepy and kind of glowy. And in this, they will, they can generally be coming right at you with those glowy eyes, you know, which again, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that a game got made out of the, the found footage. You know, I'm, I gotta admit, I tend to like you know, 
found footage horror. I know there's, you know, there, there are definitely too many today, but, and, and some of the, the concepts, wasn't one of the recent ones time trap? Yeah, that's absurd. But yeah, a lot of the early ones, I really, you know, I, I really like both Paranormal Activity 1 and 3. 2 and 4 exist, and I like, and you know, I, I enjoy in, in kind of a, an ironic kind of way the marked ones, and trailers for what is it, the ghost dimension <laughs> did not expect them to actually yeah, but I'm I'm gonna be watching it. I I you've got my you've got my interest. But but yeah, you know, some of the early ones I really quite like, and I'm really glad we now have a game of it. And I hope we get more. You know, I know that there's a sequel on the way to to this. And I also I like to see the developers of this, like with you know, Penumbra, Amnesia, and Sona, move on to other concepts. But, you know, with horror and, yeah. The, but, but yeah, the, the limited range of the IR means that if you, if or when you spot someone else, you might have also been spotted. Because, you know, they can, you're not giving off light, but they can kind of sense you. You know, you can kind of sense if someone, you know, something living of, of you know, approximate size to you is is you know relatively close by so yeah and at the same time you can be just far enough you know so suddenly you may have to run even if you thought you spotted them as, as fast as you could and you, you, you know you may want to be running the camera all the time during the game just only using the IR when you really have to but yeah at the same time it enables the actively hiding because you can sometimes see them from meters away. And if they're moving, you know, in a certain direction and you're either backing away from them moving or you're just moving in a different direction and you're just like, well, he's going to keep going that direction. If I go in a completely different direction, you know, we'll be moving apart. So when he comes closer to me, I will have had time to, you know, make progress, you know, find some stuff I need to activate something I need to, you know, something along those lines, and yeah, it, it really works quite well for that. And the, the zoom function is also very useful because you don't necessarily want to get too close to the scary stuff, but if the scary stuff is in the dark, you may have to move closer than you'd like because it's not gonna, you know, no matter how much or how little you're zoomed in or out, you know, the, the IR will only only has the range that it does. So yeah, but but yeah, at the same time it can be really useful because you can get an idea of, you know, again, if it's a well lit area, how big is this place? And what doors can I already see are broken or blocked, and which ones could I use? Yeah. There are not that many achievements in this, and relatively little replay value. You know, in part because a few achievements, and also just, yeah, it's, yeah. It's already been pointed out that this has an especially strong start, that it's not terribly original, that it's essentially a roller coaster, and, you know, for that, just still too long, you know, it, it overstays its welcome because it is just, it's it's intended to be like constantly really scary and yeah. And others have pointed out, you know, there are times where you're wondering why can't I leave through, you know, that window or jump that fence. The controls are somewhat intuitive. There is no real heads-up display to, you know, distract 
your attention from the deep immersion. The only thing you really have is the realistic camera display, you know, battery amount and bar, you know, whether the IRR is on or off, and whether you're not doing recording, which of course you are whenever you have the camera out, and the counter, the time counter for recording, which actually does count up exactly, you know, you can, you can be, you know, playing for 10 minutes without the camera out. The moment you bring it back up, you're recording again, and then it starts counting up from there, you know, and when you reach the end of the game, you can look at, the, you know, you can bring out the camera and you can actually see how much have I recorded over the course of this game. Although you cannot rewatch it, which I'm told you may, you, you will be able to in the second one. And, you know, on the easiest difficulty setting, you can carry 10 batteries tops. So, yeah, the, the harder, the fewer the batteries. And I think they also, the batteries are used up faster. So, yeah, they really have to be on the move for that to work well. Now, the levels are very linear. There are no real hub levels. And most, there's like, you know, either side of the stationary object that you're supposed to activate. And, you know, maybe you have to go find something in, you know, either, you know, either or both sides. Or you have to pick something up that you have to bring back. The, the, the various levels are relatively varied. You know, a, a dank basement, there's a cell block with padded cells, and... A sewer level, of course, and parts of this place, you know, you can tell that this is an ancient, you know, this, this place has been around for a long time, both in, like, you know, design, you know, windows, and floors, and general architecture, and the fact that parts of it are literally falling apart. You know, the, the floor will collapse under you several times, and, yeah. And this has unity of setting, which Amnesia almost had, you know. In this, once you're inside the asylum, you are inside the asylum. You're, like I say, you know, almost instantly Miles wants to leave. You become trapped in the asylum very early on. And then, just, yeah. And the... Yeah, basically... You know, in in the trailer, in one of the trailers, you see the asylum during the day. That doesn't happen in this game. That, that doesn't happen in the game itself. You drive in there, and it's like raining and dark. And, you know, perfect time to go and, and explore. You know, Miles is very confident that nothing in there will be, you know, absolutely terrifying or anything. But, yeah. From when you start up the game, it is just disturbing from start to finish. And it's been pointed out that there is a little freedom in the exploration and openness of levels. The there aren't really different themes to the different areas the way, you know, System Shock 2 and Amnesia 1 have. In one part, you're literally shown the exit, but you can't quite go there yet. You have to, you know, find a way to get back there. And then, you know, yeah, when, when you get there, it's not necessarily exactly what you expected for there to be. And this has, you know, things will happen to Miles that leave a real impact on him. And just, you know, a lot like, you know, in the Batman Arkham games, at least the first two of those that the only ones have played, where, you know, like, 
yeah, you know, the, his suit will get ripped or the like. And for the rest of the game, it's still ripped because he didn't go somewhere and pick up a new one, you know. And, you know, in this, it's that you lose a ring finger and an index finger and thus can no longer distinguish whether you're east side or west side. And that's just, that's just wrong. The graphics are pretty good. Some will find this scary, while others will find it that it's just too over the top from right away, and there's really nowhere else to go from there. You know, from maybe five or ten minutes in, you know, it's extremely gory with like a dozen decapitated heads and one ripped out intestine after another. And it's not gory always, you know, it's not always gory in the game. There are times where it's only gloomy, but yeah, when when it's gory, it's usually, you know, really, really gory, and the gloom is also, yeah, it's, there's, there's no real downtime, which again, you know, Penumbra, System Shock 2, Amnesia 1 give, and it, with the contrast, it makes it more effective, and yeah, you know, like Chen Yu would say, you out of 10, need to be at a 2. It's just, yeah, after a while, it does get to be relatively bottomy, monotony. It's, you know, it's big, loud, Clive Barkery, you know, slasher flick. Now, the... To briefly talk about jump scares, I want to start by defining what jump scares are because I feel like the word gets thrown around a lot today, and it's true that there's way there are way too many jump scares in horror today. But basically, when something isn't a jump scare, it's when it's gradually developing. the The thing that we're scared of is gradually developing, built to think of Kane leaving the the Nostromo and the whole time he's outside the you know, as as he gradually gets closer and closer to the egg room and the whole you know there's there's a jump there but it's not like completely unexpected. You know, you you can tell that you know you, you really don't want him to go further there. There's clearly something horribly just yeah. And you know, another example would be in The Shining, as Danny drives down, you know, as, as he turns corners and drives further and further down the hallways. Yeah, it genuinely, it builds to it. On the other hand, a jump scare is when you did not know it was there, when it pops up. You, you might say it's unfair scares. You know, it's when, when something jumps out that you already knew was was there and you were just waiting for it that's not at least not as much of a jump scare as when it's just you know yeah suddenly there there is you know the was it, nostalgia credit this thing with cat cat yeah and yes this does have jump scares as many point out but it does also have genuine suspense you know, very early on, you pass this patient who's in a wheelchair, and you have a pretty good idea that he's alive, but he does not seem to be quite awake. And, you know, you, you pass him, and then, you know, within minutes, you realize, I have to go back past him, and you know there's going to be something. And there's nothing you you just have to make your way past him, you know. And other times when you know you're actively hiding, you're yeah, you're scared of them finding you, or scared of accidentally you know moving into a place that you shouldn't have, and then you know them being able to get you. But but yeah, I should maybe specify you know when it just comes down to a game of tag. I found that when they like chase you down a hallway or the like, 
you know, let's say there's a room with two doors. If you once you enter that room, they're going to go through one of those doors and come at you. You can then go out through the other door and thus, you know, get some distance between you and yeah, I, I found that that was usually the case. Some, sometimes you could even, like, they could chase you in to, you know, and, you know, just somewhere where you couldn't leave, where you have to get back past them, and you can manage to, you know, maybe lure them to move around. Like, if there's a couch in the way, once they're starting to move around the couch either side, you can just run around, you know, the other side of the couch and such, and... Yeah, I hardly ever got caught by them, even when they seemed to have me, you know, kind of boxed in. And, and you know, some say that there is kind of a trial and error nature to some of the later chases. I found that there's kind of, there's a trick to it or trick to them, you know, when, when a certain enemy chases you once you realize the the way that it goes then you know what to do you know it's still scary and intense but then you know what to do you know again I didn't have very many trial and error experiences and you know when I did get killed you know sometimes it was just because you know I was like oh wait there are two doors and obviously it was the other one you know And yeah, and this was praised has been praised for its horror elements. And Miles's panic mirrors ours. And you know, the, this uses thunder and lightning. Well, you know, it, it is a dark and rainy night. You know, as, as cliche as that is. This, like Penumbra and Least Amnesia One, doesn't have any healing situations and. This, unlike those games, also doesn't have any healing items, and yeah, it is kind of like, I mean, when you play Silent Hill, you find healing items, you're going to need those healing items. In this and in Penumbra and Amnesia, you, you know, you regenerate health anyway, you know, and then there are so many situations where you just die, where you don't get hurt and have to heal, but you just die, so yeah, what's the point? And, and in this, it also regenerates health. I, I was never like staying around like, oh man, I would really love to have just one healing item right now. Whereas, you know, again, Penumbra and Amnesia 1, I found that it was like, you know, I could, I could count how many healing items that I had found in the overall game just by right before I complete the game, just looking at how many I had because I didn't use any. Some have said this is way too difficult. I, again, I find that once you kind of, I mean, maybe it is if you don't actively hide and if you don't, you know, and, and if you get chased into, you know, if you get kind of locked into a corner and you don't run out or you can't, you know, maybe I was really lucky, I don't know. I, yeah, I could see it being really frustratingly difficult. This has four difficulty settings, and it's challenging even on easy. Now, where, you know, I read different numbers for this. Some say they completed in like six hours. Some say it's level two. You know, this took me four hours, and on a replay, I could probably cut one, maybe even two hours off that. And, you know, by comparison, the, you know, on the second replay, the Penumbras took me five hours each, and, you know, Amnesia 1 took me six hours. On the first playthrough, Amnesia took me about 11, and I do not have the numbers for my first playthroughs of Penumbra, the Penumbra games. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.